So in the early 2000s, a, one of the readers to The Economist writes a letter to the editor of the British weekly, The Economist, and, and complains about the fact that in an article about Muslims living in Russia, that the, they're referred to as immigrants on Russian land. The reader writes to the editor that this is not accurate because, in fact, according to some historiographers, Muslims have lived on Russian land before Christians have lived on Russian land. That is, that, the, that because of Russia's late Christianity, arrival to Christianity, that in fact Muslims preceded Christians, and so they shouldn't be uh, referred to as immigrants in Russian territory. Now, the economist asked of Putin, this was in 2002, the economist asked of Putin something it never asked of its own prime ministers or leaders, which is it proposed that perhaps Putin, in the wake of 9-11 and September 11th uh, terrorist act, that maybe Russia could be a model for the West's relationship to Islam. That instead of having this global war on terror, perhaps Mo Russia, because of its relationship with 500, 600, 700 years of Muslims living on its territory, could offer a, another way forward as opposed to kind of the confrontational, uh, let's say, uh, advers adversarial way that had been led by the United States and, and some Western European nations. And this is, of course, very rich coming from The Economist because uh, given the role of uh, Tony Blair and, and, and uh, ginning up the facts that led to the Iraq War. But the relationship of, of Russia vis-a-vis -vis its East is something that we're going to talk about this afternoon, and namely how it differs from other countries' relationships to the East, or the kind of the idea of Orientalism that we've come to associate with the term. I'll, most of you are familiar with Edward Said, but for those of you who are not, I'll give a brief introduction. Um, Said was a, published a, a book called Orientalism, which delivered a very a much needed critique of 200 odd years of uh, that led to post-colonial studies, where he basically analyzed the relationship of knowledge and power, and that essentially the way that Western Orientalists had been studying the East was a way to reassert their own. Um, supremacy. So the, of course the kind of traditional orientalist depictions of the East, the way that Catherine the Great also depicted the East is, uh, as you can see in the Rasismus exhibition uh, at, the at the Hygiene Museum, is that Muslim nations are much more sensual, much more uh, exotic, much more, uh, much more lifestyle places, and by, by extension, without, without it being said, that implies that Western Europe is much more rational, analytical, and sort of efficient. I'll let Said himself uh, explain it in a, kind of, in a couple words. The idea behind my book on Orientalism is um, to seek out the origins and the coherence of descriptions of the Orient that began to appear in Europe in the end of the 18th, early 19th century that were different from uh, the descriptions of the Orient that had appeared before. Orientalism is, is really about the manufacture of the other. And that, and that other is really uh, of great convenience to oneself. And it can only be done for, I mean, it's mainly done for purposes of domination. And that knowledge and domination in the imperial context almost always go together. So if, as Peter the Great had prophesied, that Russia's sort of missionary role was to acquaint Europe with Asia and Asia with Europe, as, P as Alexander Herzen said, then in fact, we can start by studying the, the first Orientalist departments that were founded in Russian universities. In 1804, Alexander II um, established four universities outside of the main uh, centers of learning, outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. And it's very telling where they were, of course, because none of them are today in, in Russia, uh, except for one. One was in Kharkiv, in current eastern Ukraine. The other one was in um, Vilnius. The third one was in Kazan. And I'm blanking where the fourth one is, but uh, it'll come to me. But the one in Kazan is the one that interests us, because Kazan is in current day Tatarstan, which is a, an autonomous region within Russia. And by 1830, Kazan had a lot, has the only 
Turkic languages departments in the whole of, Europe, of the whole world, in fact, not even in any Turkic-speaking lands, and also had the most important Mongol studies departments. And Kazan is sort of a, a, a gateway, or was considered to be a gateway, or kind of caravanserai of learning on the way to the east, in a sense that it lies east of the Ural Mountains. And, and in fact, when we think of Tatarstan today as an interesting counterpoint to the cliche that we have, again, through our news media, which is that somehow Russia is Islamophobic or Russia is oppressing Chechnya because of its Islamic culture or Muslim culture. It's not exactly true because, in fact, Tatarstan is another region within Russia that has its oil receipts um, as Chechnya wanted, but uh, does so in a kind of, in a, in a federal manner. So it doesn't have the, and it never had the problems that Chechnya had. Chechnya is a much more complex issue, was in fact much more about banditry and, uh, and, and economy than it was about any kind of ideological question. Now, the history of Russia, if you look at Russian history, it's the threat always came from the steppe, the way the Russians present it and the way the West is presenting it. And what is the steppe exactly? Well, the steppe is a very peculiar geographic formation. It's kind of like a, a middle finger to topographers because it's not exactly a forest and it's not exactly a desert. So it's kind of like a stunted forest or an unambitious desert in some sense. It's the, but the steppe is somewhere where, if you look at, of course, medieval Russian uh, history from Kiev and Rus, which, uh, which in the 10th, 11th century, again, the, the, the relationship to the Turkic tribes, the Mongol and Tatar hordes that invaded Russia and that ruled Kiev and Rus for a couple centuries is much more complex than it, the way it's been presented, both in Russia and also in Western historiography. Because if one thing that people agree upon, there's very little that it seems today the West and Russia agree upon, but one of the few things they do agree upon is somehow that the reason why Russia is behind today is that it, because it, it, it was ruled by the Tatars and Mongols, this idea that because of Genghis Khan, that's why everything is blamed on Genghis Khan. Everything from feudal economics and political systems to the dysfunctioning toilets at the Sochi Olympics is always laid at the, at the question of, oh, it's because Russia was not, uh, was not, uh, did not develop democracy in the, middle, in the late medieval ages or, the, or it represented the government because it was under these Turkic tribes. In fact, the only people who seem to re revisit the importance of, or the non-destructive nature of the Tatar and Mongol hordes are strangely MBA programs, business programs. This is a real book. These are two real books that are given to MBA students at many universities uh, in England and in the United States. One is Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun, and the other one is Leadership Secrets of Genghis Khan. So I guess for kind of, for raider financial types to, uh, to learn from. The irony is that the, the very organ of today's Russian nationalism is the one that benefited the most from these Tatar and Mongol hordes, mainly the Orthodox Church, because it was really in the Orthodox Church that it was during the, the Tatar invasions of, uh, or ruling of, of Moscow and Kiev and Rus that the Orthodox Christianity became a symbol of Russian identity. Before that, Orthodox Christianity was not associated as strongly with the ethnic identity of being Russian or Rus, I should say, or even Slavic. And the, as we know today, uh, the Tatar-Mongol hordes were actually quite tolerant in terms of faith. They, were, they allowed different faiths to administer to the faithful, so they allowed the Orthodox Church to function, but under one condition, which is that they had to pray, so the Orthodox priests had to pray for the health of the Han. So it's a very interesting sort of case of what we call the Shpagat, the, the Han, the Orthodox priest, the father, had to pray in public for the health of the Han, but privately he was cursing the Han that he was praying for, so he had to kind of do the do a, a bit of a, a double take. Now this, this spagat is, uh, is something which is, is a bit of a, a methodology for us. I can try to do it here. It's actually quite a slippery surface. I'm, not, I'm still learning, but not good enough to do it properly. But it's not the spagats of the legs that I want to do. Actually, it's more the spagat of the, of the mind, is how can we wrap kind of our mind around two very uh, distinct and often mutually exclusive conflicting ideas. So in our biography, there's the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. There are the geopolitical narratives that accompany these walls, communism and political Islam. Um, we can see upstairs there's humor and sort of spirituality or religion or faith, things that you don't often bring together in the same sentence. And there's many terms for this in English, most of which have a Latin uh, root. 
Um, and an important one for us, of course, is the idea of coincidenti oppositorum, which is a Christian idea very, uh, that Haman was using very much, uh, which is the idea that to, to describe the transcendent, you cannot use rational language, because by its very nature, the transcendent or the holy is non-rational. So you have to describe God through paradox, for example, and through amphiboly, and not through sort of a clear rational language. Another example of this metaphysical splits for us is uh, the idea of, of, again, communism and Islam. Normally, you don't put Marx and Muhammad in the same phrase or in the same screen. Um, but there's many scholars who have done this, including people like Olivier Roy, the French sociologist, but also uh, Norman Brown, the comparative literature professor who, who devoted the last 10 years of his life to reading the Quran. As a, as a way of, of understanding modernist literature. And he said that until James Joyce existed, there was no way for us to appreciate modernist literature because he called communism and he called sorry, Marxism and Islam, he called them two old revolutionary forces, two tired old horses, but we should not take any pleasure from their failure because they agree on, on one proposition, which is that there shall be one world or there shall be none. Now, an army of internet trolls would be very unhappy to hear this, but unlike the German and the Polish eagle, the Russian eagle really swings both ways. And it's this, this idea of, of facing east and west that we see in the Russian eagle, but it's also the idea of, if, as you can see, it's the heraldry is Byzantine, so that you're holding the scepter as a sign of the Tsar being the ruler, earthly ruler, but also the representative of, of the vice regent of Christ uh, on earth. So again, trying to bring this secular and, and sacred power together in one, in one space, this, this debate of whether Russia is a Western or an Eastern uh, culture or nation is an important one, and it's, it was really the main debate of 19th century Russian intellectual history. So the opening volley, if you will, of this, of this debate was launched by a gentleman named Pyotr Chadayev, who's here. And Chadayev is a really interesting figure. He wrote a book where he basically says that because Russia has not achieved anything so far, it's better for it to start from scratch. And you can imagine how that went down in Russia, uh, which is not, Russia is not the most open to its own criticism. What happens is immediately Chadayev is put into house arrest and declared mentally ill. And it's the first case of mental illness being used to silence a critic in Russia that we then see during uh, communism, of course. Now, Chadayev, this, this debate between East and West, should Russia face West, like Peter the Great believed and sort of be a Western European nation, or as the Slavophiles, the others believe that Russia should actually face its Eastern, Turkic, Mongol, Persian, Chinese neighbors and not the West, is, is a particularly um, telling one for us, and for me personally, because I've never felt more at home, strangely, than living in Moscow in the early 2000s, for the very simple reason that Russians, I, I, the way I describe Russians, I hope there's no Russians here today, I, they'll be flattered anyway, but Russians are essentially, in my opinion, white people who act like brown people. And that's why I like them so much, because I like the way white people look, but I prefer the way brown people act. And what I mean by that is, it's not just a joke, it's, it's in fact, intellectual history or education of Russia is Western, like mine. They learn the Greeks, we learn the Greeks, we learn the Germans, Shakespeare, Romans. Our education is European, but the way Russians act, meaning their home culture, is not at all European. In fact, it, it's in the way that, that way the tea is drunk, the way that dinner is served, the way that emotions are, are expressed is not the way that your heat, for example, bathrooms in Russia are heated all the time. You know, in Western Europe, people don't heat their bathrooms unless they're in the bathroom, right? And this is a, it's, it's just one approach to energy efficiency, but it's also, it says a lot about a kind of a, a largesse of living. Now, Chadayev believed that, in fact, Russia should, Russia, Chadayev was a Westerner. He believed Russia should copy the West, but should start from scratch. And after he wrote this book and was silenced, he published a, another text to apologize and say that, in fact, he really was trying to criticize Russia because he believed in its strength, but his criticism was coming from somewhere which is very, let's say, uh, sincere. And in fact, again, I, I think you'll agree, you often don't spend a lot of time criticizing something unless you really care about it. 
And Chadayev, in our opinion, is sort of the equivalent of um, today's sort of tiger mom. Do you know what a tiger mom is? Is anybody here familiar with what a tiger mom is? So tiger moms is a phenomenon that's become sort of a, 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 a slang for the Asian way of par parenting, which is that you're super strict on your kids. Basically, a, a Yale professor named Amy Chua, she's a legal professor, she writes a book and she says, she's American Chinese, and she says, Westerners, you're all educating your kids the wrong way. You're spoiling them, saying that you're so special, you're so beautiful, you're so smart. Actually, the way to raise a child is to punish them unless they're the best. So if they don't have the best grades, you don't give them dinner until they have the best grades. And this became a kind of a, a shorthand for tiger parenting. And, and, and Chadayev, in, in our opinion, is a kind of tiger mom. He, he, in fact, is criticizing Russia from a point of affection, where he's trying to kind of be a bit stricter with Russia's sort of intellectual history. Now, if you look at Russia's march eastwards, in some ways, Russia mirrors the United States in the same way that the United States has this, in its men, this kind of manifest destiny of the anthem from sea to shining sea, and the West the pushed westwards the frontier, Russia was pushing eastwards to the same ocean, right? The Americans were pushing to the Pacific westwards, and the Russians were pus pushing eastwards to the Pacific and southwards to the Caucasus. There's a great book by Alexander Etkind where he talks about the self-colonization of Russia, that essentially Russia, if you look at the, the fur trade, that Russia's fur trade can trace the, col the colonization of different territories because the fur trade was, like an, was a, almost like a kind of silk road of Russian uh, manufacturing, is that at, different, at, at a certain amount of kilometers, there was an outpost for, different, for catching and raising and sending back fur across Europe. Very much like the amber route is another form of, let's say, trade route that we don't often think about. We think about the silk route, but there's many of these, the spice route, silk route. And these, these fur routes actually were were a reason why in, in Russian um, colonial, let's say, expansion, deforestation meant colonization. So it was this, this process of deforesting to allow to catch these wild animals and send their pelts and their skins back across Europe or to Asia for trade. Now, the reason why Russia's relationship with the Turkic tribes is complex is because, in fact, it was the Turkic tribes' extensive, let's say the Tatar-Mongol hordes, extensive commercial network which allowed Russia to have a relationship and economic uh, relationships with many places in the Middle East and trade in a way that it wasn't able to do before. Now, this, uh, in fact, in some instances, when you look at, at, uh, at Russia, the Orthodox Church believed that the Catholic Church was a bigger enemy than Islam. Unfortunately, that's not the case as much today, but the reason for that is that, is that in the Catholic Church, it's, there, was a, there, was a sec, there was a worldly leader, which was a threat, being the Pope. Even today, in China, the Catholic Church, for the past hundred years, during Communist China, the Catholics are the most suspiciously looked upon, much more than Protestants and much more than Muslims, because there is no one Protestant leader, there's no one Muslim leader, there is one Catholic leader, so there's a kind of worldly leader of Catholicism that is a threat to a, 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 govern, a governing power, whether it was um, the, uh, the, the Orthodox Church at the time or, or today's, let's say, Communist Party in China. Now, Russia, Russia Christianized in 988, I believe, and it, and it, became, it took on Christianity according to the, the legend is that Vladimir I in Khersonesus, which is in today's Crimea, which explains one reason why Krim is such a, a sensitive topic both for Ukrainians and Russians, is Vladimir summoned the leaders of the three major faiths and they presented their religions to him and he chose, the legend is that he chose Orthodox Christianity because he was sort of impressed by the bling bling of the icons, the gold icons. And one of the Russian Orientalists, important ones in the 19th century, early 20th, Bartold, found evidence, in fact, in the primary chronicles, uh, kind of like the Nibelungen of, of Russian historiography, where there was apparently a documentation that Vladimir regretted his choice of choosing Orthodox Christianity shortly afterwards because he didn't anticipate the question of alcoholism in Russia at the time, and that Islam, that Islam was actually kind of a second runner-up. So if we think about Russia as a kind of, imagine as an alternative scenario where Russia would have been a Muslim nation, it would have, of course, very much um, complicated the narrative we have today of Islam as a kind of, let's say, Eastern, very foreign 
um, culture, or it wouldn't, because in fact, the first time Western Europe started to treat Orientalism was in the Enlightenment period, when Rousseau and Voltaire were talking about Poland and Russia as these kind of frontier uh, barbarian lands in Europe. They were the first Orient was, for Western Europe was in fact Russia and Poland. This is a great image of, 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 of the Friday prayers right in front of Lenin and right in the, in the Red Square. Now, the, Rush, the, the question of, the big question that sort of interests both academics but scholars of Orientalism and post-colonialism today is, was Russia a colonial power or not? And the answer to that is, the Russians have a word which is kind of like the, the German Jain. The answer is sort of Danyet which is yes, no, it was a colonial power, but it also wasn't a colonial power. Why? Well, there's three main reasons. One is that, unlike the English and the French, Russia didn't go very far away to capture another territory. So the, the English went, for example, to India. The French went across the, the, uh, the sea to North Africa. The Russians went right across their own border and conquered or, or ruled people who had previously, in some sense, ruled them. So imagine if Indians had ruled England in the 14th century, and then England sort of comes back in the 16th century and decides it's our turn now, we're gonna rule you. It sort of deflates the missionizing zeal or the belief, this kind of uh, belief that you are bringing civilization. It it's punctures that narrative a little bit. The second reason is that, of course, uh, Bolshevik and communist ideology was anti-imperialist. So even if communism did extend colonial policies, it couldn't do it as shamelessly as non-communist nations because the idea was to give a voice to the oppressed and, and in fact, one of these terms, even the term inarodse, inarod means another peoples of another race in some sense. And originally this term was used to grant uh, safety measures or liberties to non-Russian native indigenous peoples, for example, for grazing, for, nomad, for nomadic life, but also for legal powers uh, at some time, it ended up becoming a racist term later on because, of course, any term which is used to describe an other will eventually oppress that other. It's very hard for that term to allow a space of agency for that other. The third reason is that immediately in the 20s, Bolsheviks started to train local people to study their own cultures. So by 1920s, you already had Kazakh ethnographers, Kyrgyz linguists, so you empowered people and of course the argument to that could be, oh, they're just self-colonized because they're, they're taught by Russian educational system, but that's a bit too simplistic. Finally, all these, made, these are the major Orientalists. This is like a kind of hall of fame of Russian Orientalism. All these Orientalists, if you can barely read the names, Vasily Bartold, Oldenburg, Kavalevsky, none of them are Russian ethnic, none of them are, none of them are ethnic Russians. And that complicates the question is that if you're not an ethnic Russian, then your relationship to ethnicity and nationhood is gonna be a bit more uh, complex than if you are an ethnic Russian. You're not gonna use your knowledge in the service of power as, as readily or as easily. For example, Bartold was a German Balt, so the Germanic Baltic nations living in, in, the, uh, in Russian Empire. Oldenburg was a, a Russian Jew. Rosen was a Russian Jew. Kazanbek is a Persian who, who converts to Presbyterianism. Kowalewski is Polish. He's the first uh, professor of Mongolian studies in Europe. Bartold is an important Tur Turkologist and, and Iranologist. Nikolai Mar is a Georgian. Sherbatskoy is a, is a Buddhist scholar, Polish. So Russia is, has, has always been a multi-ethnic and multi-confessional society. In fact, far more diverse than any Western European or even, even America in a sense. There's more ethnicities and, and nationalities and, and languages spoken on the territory, which is normal for a country which spans one-sixth of the land mass. But what's, what, what's interesting is if we scratch the surface of Russian Orientalism, it all goes actually back to German Orientalism because all the Russian Orientalists were trained by German Orientalists, either in Tübingen and Leipzig. Um, and the, the, this is how it kind of brings, we bring it back to the exhibition upstairs. In some sense, the, 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 the exhibition really asks the question of whether, to what extent Germany is a Western nation as we imagine it. Is not Germany also a central? Even the terms we use today, you know, it's very funny, but when I was studying Slavistics, Poland was Eastern Europe. Today it's not Eastern Europe anymore, it's Central Europe. 
You know, it's, and it's this kind of rebranding. So I don't know what's Eastern Europe anymore other than Russia and Ukraine. I think everything else is now Central Europe. So eventually, there will be no Eastern Europe. We'll just have Asia and Europe, I assume. I don't know if that's a, if that's a progress or not. But if you look at uh, certain, certain German uh, writers, in fact, the German Orientalists, we've been going to Orientology conferences for several years all over the world, and to this day, some of the most important Orientologists are German-speaking. I don't, I don't mean German, there's nothing ethnically superior, of course, about Germans studying Islam, but whether it's Austrian or Swiss German or German or Hungarian German, in fact, the interesting thing is that the reason, or my understanding of why Germans' understanding of Islam, a German scholar's understanding of Islam is different, is that, well, there's two main reasons. One is that apparently German universities secularized much later than French and English universities. So you could be a believing Christian scholar in the late 19th century and still be an important analytical philosopher. Whereas in France, that's not possible. In England, it's not possible to be a, 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 a active Protestant, let's say, or it's much more difficult, let's say, to be an active Protestant in the early 20th, late 19th century and a respected scholar of analytical philosophy, let's say. And the German approach to, because of Germany's relative lack of empire, of course it had colonies, but compared to the French and the English and the Dutch, being an Oriental, Orientalist was no way a ticket to a career. So if you were an Orientalist, you essentially were, were either jobless or you were, remained an academic. So the study of the Orient remained very esoteric and in fact very religious in nature because of the kind of kultur protestantismus, even, meaning that even Catholic Germans had this uh, attempt to read medieval Jewish texts or medieval Muslim texts, the reason was to find out another approach to understanding holy texts. And, and it's very, very rare to find scholars who are able to analyze on one hand, it's kind of, again, the spagat, it's a scholar who can do real analysis on one hand, but also live a religion, let's say, or, or understand a religious text affectively or metaphysically is very, very rare. Because unfortunately we have this kind of this secular divide where we believe that if you're religi religiously active, you cannot be a good scholar, and if you're a good scholar, you cannot be religious, which I think is a bit too simplistic. I really want to do a, another lecture performance which just basically does a quick, quick slide by slide of like people that are accused of being Muslim, but that are not, like Obama, Prince Charles. The reason why I think Prince Charles is a Sufi Muslim is that We've been on three very obscure research trips to eastern Poland where the Tatars live, to Xinjiang in western China, and within three weeks of our being there, Prince Charles arrived, so either he's trolling us, <laughs> or he has, and he also started this Prince Charles Foundation where he's supporting the crafts of like Muslim crafts and artisanal work, which is super, super activity. It's just that I don't think he'll ever come out as a Muslim uh, in, in kind of the current climate. It's not such a crazy idea to come out as a Muslim if you're a royal a royal uh, member, actually, because it's happened, crazier things have happened in the, in the past century. But um, one of these people who was accused of, or Kaiser Wilhelm, actually, in the late 19th century, he changed this equation of Germany's relationship to the East, because he decided that it was important for Germany to have its colonies, and he did it in a very, let's say, rushed and not so successful manner. And one of the ways he did so is he spread the rumor amongst uh, the Ottoman Empire that he had secretly converted to Islam and that he was doing a Hajj so that people would, would believe that Germany really was a friend of Islam. And um, there's our Muslim former president. Um, and so when, uh, when Kaiser Wilhelm did his famous trip to the Orient in 1898, he went to Jerusalem, of course, to, to lay a stake claim to the Holy Lands, also to, to, to ensure his, the deals about the railroad, of course, the Berlin-Baghdad Railroad. But the, the, the best story of this trip is he raises a toast to 300 million Muslims and says, you know, Germany is a friend of Islam. It shows how little Kaiser Wilhelm understood Islam if he's raising a toast to show how much he's a friend of Muslims, right? But anyway, put that aside. He also comes with another kind of faux pas, which is that he brings, he brings, a, um, he brings a new uh, tomb for Salah al-Din, you know, the famous, uh, the famous warrior who was who pardoned the Christian crusading uh, forces that he beat. And uh, Saladin is buried in Damascus in the Umayyad Mosque, but he's buried in a kind of very shabby cardboard uh, 
tomb on the right. Kaiser Wilhelm brings a beautiful marble tomb. And the, the Ottomans, in a very Middle Eastern manner, they say thank you very much, but they don't move Saladin, they just accept it, put it there, and there's a sign when you walk in, it says, you can see it here a little bit, the true grave of the virtuous body of Saladin, and here is just the gift from Kaiser Wilhelm. So it's like, it's a very weird uh, uh, experience of, of doubling. You don't know which one is which, but it's labeled, this is a gift and this is the real, one, real thing. Now, the, it gets even more kind of spicy, as upstairs some of the pieces we can see with these mirror pieces upstairs, is that in 1915, the Ottoman Sultan declares jihad on certain nations, of course, the, the enemy nations being the Russians, the French, and the English. And when he declares jihad, the, this is part of a strategy that was a strategy concocted by Max von Oppenheim, who was an archaeologist and orientalist living in Cairo at the time, and, and a very interesting figure, actually. And Max von Oppenheim was leading the Nachrichtenstelle for den Orient at the time, and his strategy was to set the East aflame, to really motivate all the Muslims to rise up against their colonial powers. And, part of, and this meant building a mosque in, Z in Zosen, in Wunsdorf, outside of Berlin, allowing the Muslim prisoners of war to play, play kind of uh, football and cricket, and publishing a Zeitung for the Muslim prisoners of war called El Jihad in all the languages of the Muslim subjects. So here you have Arabic, and here you have Russian. You can see Tsel Gazette here, and the Arabic here. Gusisha Al-Sgaba and the Arabic al -Sgaba. Now, when this was declared, this, this jihad was declared, it was immediately responded to by the English as saying, this is the jihad made in Germany. And uh, as, as we've often said, it's, there's a very, that's a very strange way to criticize a jihad, is to call it made in Germany. Because today, of course, made in Germany is a sign of very good quality, highly engineered. So what does it mean? Is, it kind of, is this a jihad that's going to last you for 30 years and you buy it once and you have a money-back guarantee? Or what do they mean exactly by, by made, in, uh, made in Germany jihad? Well, obviously what they meant was it's an illegitimate jihad, that it has no religious credibility because it was conceived in Germany. But what we started to do was we started to look in the Duden and find other examples of Jews in Germany that are in German that are using the DSCH, which you can see outside. And we've used the, the different terms. Normally, of course, the, the official words in German that use DSCH are all these kind of greatest hits of, of Orientalist terms, like Jalaba, Jin from Jini. This is not gin and tonic, by the way. This is the other gin. Genghis Khan. My favorite, of course, is Jungle Fiba. Jizya. Jizya is a tax that non-Muslims were supposed to pay if they lived under Muslim rule. The Jews and the, and the Christians would pay a tax to be able to be Jews and practice Jews and Jewish, Judaism and Christianity. And, of course, this J is a form of, of German language marking a term as not our culture, not German, because... There is no J in German, but there are other Js that are used without the DSCH. For example, outside you can see the banner jogging shoe, or you can order a gin tonic, or you can buy jeans, or you can talk about gentrifizierung. These are Js that are using the G or the J, but there's no problem in pronouncing them as Js because they're kind of our Western shared culture. And these are our other. It's, kind of, it's like Said said, it's a, kind of, it's a way of creating or fabricating the other in a way to distinguish oneself from that culture. Now, briefly before we end, I want to talk about Krim, because Krim and Crimea is a very interesting case of the first time Russia starts to use the tropes in the language of Orientalism, meaning when Catherine the Great conquers Crimea from the Ottomans in 1787, she does this because it gives Russia a southern warm territory that's like a colony like the French have Algeria and Morocco and the English have India, she now has a Muslim majority place where people are smoking shishas and drinking tea and it's very sensuous and there's flowers blooming. So it becomes a kind of tropical uh, hinterland for her and for the empire. But of course, according to, according to the, the Crimean Tatars, there was so much deforestation that happened when the Russians occupied or invaded Crimea 
that the temperature of Crimea dropped five degrees because of the winds that were blowing from the Arctic were able to come all the way to Krim, whereas before they weren't able to because of these kind of dense forests. One of the interesting uh, commissions that Catherine the Great made was from a, another German ethnic, living, ethnic German living in the Russian Empire called uh, Hab Hablitz, in Russian, Gablitz, Karl Ludwig Hablitz. And he created a taxonomy of, of Crimean plants and bot bot a botanical taxonomy. And it's a very interesting taxonomy because instead of using the Linnaeus genus species, he uses a kind of palimpsest where he associates every plant species in Crimea with another plant species somewhere else in Europe. So he says, okay, this persimmon tree is the same persimmon tree of Japan. This flower you can find in France. So he kind of projects the, the, the transnational empire building onto this new territory. And Norbert Elias talks about this a lot, is that if you look at the way that royal kingdoms or royal rulers um, plan their gardens, it's actually a very telling way of their, uh, of their political systems, actually. The gardens were, of course, a representation of, of ruling ideologies and, uh, and politicals and polities in some sense. Now, Krim, of course, is the first orient for Russia, but interestingly enough, again, like the Shpagat, it's the first Occident as well, because Krim has a lot of important, famous Greek uh, heritage. In fact, the lingua franca of Crimea until the 8th, 9th century was Greek. And you find these Greek ruins all over Crimea. And this is very important because it explains Russia's inferiority complex or insecurity complex vis-a-vis -vis the West, which is, again, if we believe the Russian narrative, which is that Russia missed out on its Greek Roman heritage. That's why Russia is behind. It doesn't have this great, you know, we, we don't have these great Rush, this, this, it's a lie, of course. This idea that Germany and Italy come from uh, Greece and Rome is, is nonsense. We all know that it passed through translation in Arabic and Andalusia and came to Western Europe after being translated from the Arabic. But nonetheless, when you learn, when you're going to school, you still learn Latin and Greek, and you're taught that we live in Western civilizations that come from the Greek and the Latin, which is fine, we won't talk about that, but the Russians didn't have this. The Russians missed out on this. They didn't have the Greek and the Romans. So when they got Crimea, they said, look, we also have our Greek heritage. And you can see that Crimea is not just considered an Eastern territory in the 18th, 19th century, but even in, in ancient times, Hellenistic times, if you remember um, Euripides' play, Iphigenius at Taurus, Taurus is, of course, the, the, the toponym for Krim. And the reason why Iphigenia wakes up in Taurus amongst the barbarians is because Taurus, crime, Crimea, was considered to be the barbarian regions for the Greeks. It was still part of the Greek, hinter, Greek language uh, sphere, but it was the barbarians. And when, when Catherine the Great conquers Crimea, she changes the names of the different parts of Crimea. So she changes Krim to Tavrida, Taurus, Greek, gives it a Greek toponym. She changes the, the river Dnieper, the Slavic name, to a Baristanes and Auxi. So she gives these Greek uh, names to what are essentially Turkic uh, a land. Even if you look at some of these uh, city names, of course, and how they've changed, one city, which is not in Krim, but we can take it as an example, Odessa. When I think of Odessa, I think of Isaac Babel, I think of like the most important Russian Jewish writers. But Odessa used to be called, until the 18th century, Haji Bey. Now, Haji Bey is about as Muslim and Turkic as a name as you can come across for a city. Haji Bey, had, Hajj, meaning the pilgrimage, a city on the way to the pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj. And Catherine the Great herself doing the Shpagat here um, is, is, in fact, a, a, a somewhat, we of course know her as an enlightened ruler, but she was enlightened in the, to the extent that she allowed, for example, Tatars and Crimean Tatars to administer their legal uh, cases and legal um, grievances in their own language, which in the 18th century is quite remarkable to allow a minority or a subject to, do, to pursue legal grievances in their own language, something we don't have uh, in many countries even today. Uh, or you can even look at another example, of course, of Eastern Europe and its integration of Islam in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of August, the, August the, 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 the Strong, let's say, mm, you had more Muslim subjects, more Muslim representatives in the parliament 
of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 17th, 18th century than you have anywhere in Europe today. So for those of us who believe in progress, I think it's a kind of, it's a counterpoint that we're not actually making much progress on this front of, of representative uh, democracy. Now, Karinizatsi was a kind of following ideology to Inarodzi, which was that as soon, in, the, in the early 20s, and for the whole 1920s actually, there was a very interesting policy which was that, and this is basically supporting all the nations of the Russian Empire to, to have their own national literature, have their own national folk outfits, their whole a national culture. So even cultures that don't have a written tradition, like the Abkhaz, were, were in some sense pushed into a literary tradition. But this was a very uh, short-lived period, and it's a reason why some people call the early Soviet Union an affirmative action empire in a way that the United States later, of course, we, were so, we associate affirmative action with sort of late 20th century America, but actually this, in, the, in the 20s and early 30s, non-Russian identities were being privileged more than Russian identity, uh, ethnicities were being privileged. But it, of course, didn't last very long, and as soon as Stalin sort of took over and the terror happened, it was consolidated behind uh, Russian rule, or so Russian ethno, ethno supremacy. So for example, Nikolai Mar, he supported Abkhaz, the first Abkhaz opera and the first Abkhaz uh, dictionary. And this idea of, of a kind of, again, the coincidental oppositorum is something that comes up and really combines what we normally don't combine, which is for us, let's say, mystical Islam or Sufism and Russian intellectual history. Because in both of these traditions, the non-rational, if you think about Russian literature, why, it, it took me a long time, almost 30 years to understand why Western writers are f completely obsessed with Russian novels. Like if you ask any American, English, German novelist, they always will say the best novels are the Russian 19th century, early 20th century. And I didn't get it because I don't read fiction so much. I don't really care about fiction as much as I should. But I got it when somebody explained to me that the reason is, is that essentially Russian literature was also Russian philosophy. If you I, I dare you to name, other than our two uh, Russian speakers here, I dare you to name a Russian philosopher. You probably can't name a Russian philosopher. And the reason why is that, in, it's true, is when you're reading a Dostoevsky or a Tolstoy, both philosophy and sociology and sort of a, a religious history is embedded in a literary fiction. So you have a kind of a, a really a, a Gesamtkunstwerk within a, a, a narrative tradition, which you don't have in French or German or English. In French, German, and English, you have literature, novels, and then you have philosophy, and then you have sociology, and then you have religious history. But they're never a kind of a mashup. And, and this is why when you look at Russian novels, the non-rational is always the kind of the, the world of the transcendent, whether it's Bulgakov, whether it's uh, Tolstoy, whether it's uh, Dostoevsky. And the, the rational is actually the sinful world of, the hum, of, the, of man, the secular world. And this is something, of course, you find in Sufism as well. For example, the highest level of perception in Sufism is considered to be apperception. So you have to, get, you have to go beyond the idea of understanding to understand these kind of apocryphal statements. This is another one of these statements. This is a quote, one of our favorite quotes from um, Thomas Merton, actually, a Catholic uh, best-selling author, of the British-born, um, but became American at some point. And he was the first Catholic priest to teach Eastern philosophy to the Catholic Church in his disciples. So in his monastery, he was teaching Zen Buddhism and he was teaching Sufism and Islam to his monastery in Kentucky. And I was very happy to hear Pope Francis quote him when he spoke to the Congress of the United States a couple years ago. And Merton wrote, Merton was one of these writers who became a kind of best-selling author in the 50s and 60s. He wrote a book called, I think, Seven Magic Mountain. And he, he, was, he was also uh, studying with people like Massignon, a French Orientalist. And Merton wrote this quote, which is, quit this world, quit the next, and quit quitting. And I'm sure you can read this many ways, but for us, this, this term means essentially even the most liberating ideology becomes a prison at some point. That actually you have to break exactly what you think is working and functioning at the moment you think it's functioning and working. And this, uh, this, this quote from Merton actually speaks volumes to Orientalism as well, because in some sense today, Edward Said, who really founded the studies of post-colonialism, it's unfortunately become almost an obstacle to knowledge as it has become an opening to knowledge. Meaning, 
God forbid today you're a white, gay man studying a medieval Muslim text, you probably won't get funding for it, or you probably will be criti cri criticized in a way that you wouldn't be if you happen to be a Muslim woman, for example. And this is the worst form of identity politics because the idea, it was not for, uh, Saeed wasn't trying to say that you have to be from the region to study the region. He was saying that, in fact, you just simply have to be able to understand the critical underpinnings of where knowledge comes from, that the relationship to knowledge has often been linked to power and to those in power. Let's hear Said again one more time. The discourse is a regulated system of producing knowledge within certain constraints, whereby certain rules have to be observed. Okay, Libya, exports. Yes, sir, you American pig. <laughs> nice touch. To think past it, to go beyond it, not to use it, is virtually impossible, because there's no knowledge that isn't codified in this way about that part of the world. So Na Said's book, Orientalism, comes out in 1978. This is exactly the same time as the Iranian Revolution is happening. And if, he, if the publishers of Viking Press, sorry, Vintage Press, had coordinated with Khomeini's PR handlers, they couldn't have imagined a better one-two punch because both Khomeini's revolution and Said basically gave a retort to what had been 200 odd years of, of Western imperialism, both in Iran, but also in the Muslim world. Because Iran, of course, had also been self-colonizing in some sense. The Shah had been westernizing at a rapid pace. He had famously uh, forbid the veil. His father famously forbid the chador, the veil, and was trying to import sort of industry and modernity in a way that wasn't necessarily uh, resonant with most Iranians. And by the time this, uh, this book came out, it really was a, it, it kind of decimated the field of Orientalism. And today, we have a lot of studies about studies of the Orient, but we don't have as many studies of subjects of the Orient. What I mean by that is that you won't find as much translations and exegesis of medieval texts, but you'll find a lot of PhD dissertations about why somebody's writing the way they're writing. So it becomes a kind of meta discourse, essentially a kind of echo chamber, somewhat like we're seeing in, in sort of leftist politics uh, on social media today. And so it really becomes about us or, us or them. You're either us, sort of with us or against us. Uh, binary thinking vis-a-vis -vis Orientalism. Let me, um, and this, this form of Orientalism really is, is in some ways akin to anti-Semitism. We've been accused of Orientalism as artists, is that we are somehow, you know, people sometimes say, oh, Payam, you know, you go to these parts of the world and you bring things back from Uzbekistan, from Iran, and, and you're presenting it to the West. Isn't that Orientalist? Well, if, it, if, it's about, if it, that's the, the accusation, then perhaps it is. But I would also argue that if you're doing research in four or five languages and, you un, and you're questioning the very presuppositions of, those, of that research you're doing, then I wouldn't, it's not necessarily Orientalist. But the problem is as soon as somebody levels Orientalism at you or anti-Semitism at you, there's no way you can shake it off. It's like, oh, you're, 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 you're an Orientalist or you're self-Orientalizing. For example, this person here is one of the people that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a very touching story that I'll end with. Ignaz, Ignaz Goldziger was a, was a Hungarian Jew who to this day is the leading scholar of Islamic jurisprudence. So Islamic law, to, to this day, 100 years later, he's still the most important authority on the subject. He wrote in German, but also in, in, in Hungarian. And he was the first non-Muslim admitted to Al-Azhar University, which for those of you who are not familiar, Al-Azhar in Cairo is kind of like, it's the equivalent of Heidelberg, Harvard, and the Vatican all together, but for Muslims. So it's like the authority of higher learning in Islam. He's the first non-Muslim admitted to this university. For three days, he has to pass a test to prove that he's worthy of studying there. So he sits down with the Hanafi Sheikh, a Sunni Sheikh in Cairo, and they go through a kind of an exam to, 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 to document, to demonstrate that he is uh, a true scholar of Islam. And only on the third day does the Hanafi Sheikh admit to Goldziger that his father was also a Jew. So essentially you have two Jews arguing and determining who is a true Muslim in the, in the late 19th century. And with that, I'll end and say thank you for your patience. And uh, if there's any questions, of course, we can do that afterwards.